Oh, well, hello, everybody. Uh, yeah. So I studied uh, some AI myself, uh, a lot of Coursera work. And after that, I tried to put it into practice at uh, the Gemeente of Amsterdam. Yeah, Gemeente Amsterdam. <laughs> uh, and there are the two things like uh, you've got these annoying parking checks going by all the cars, and they scan all the cars and uh, give you tickets, right? There's also uh, Amsterdam own version of that. It looks similar, but they create screenshot, uh, uh, 360 view shots to give like a Google Street View kind of view of the Amsterdam, but then Amsterdam's own version, open source data, yada, yada, yada. Well, they have kind of a uh, weird problem. They need to recognize license plates in order to blur them out. So I tried to do some license plate recognition in like face or like total head recognition so we can blur them out. And the other project was uh, some old documents. You know, we needed to identify which document had like personal data in them. So I did that. Uh, but today I don't, I don't want to go dive into specific. I want to go into AI and machine learning. What's it about? And then get get some uh, get to grip with the basics of it. So AI. I think most of us got acquainted with AI through some kind of evil overlord AI. Uh, this would be hell from Space Time Odyssey. And it would be a general AI. So this is an AI which can reason like us. It's got a lot of senses. Um, and it will interpret and act on those and it will learn. Right? This is just basically a better you. That's what we get. And that's part of the whole field of AI. Got general AI, that's the holy grail. And then there's narrow AI, which is more limited in scope. And unfortunately, the field of AI is like actually mostly focused here because we don't we don't have any general AI stuff. It's all future tech right now. Narrow AI, that's uh, very limited in scope. So say you've got an email classifier which says the email spam or not spam or something more fancy like an uh, autonomous car, checking stills from a video and classifying all the objects in the frame, maybe determine directions of everything. A lot more complicated, but still very limited in scope, so narrow AI. And then there's this other term floating around, machine learning. So how does that relate to AI? Well, machine learning is just learning without being explicitly explicitly programmed. I think a lot of you guys are programmers, right? So what this means is generally somebody else does the learning part for you. So they write the software for it. And then after that, they say, okay, go into the learning phase. It will learn, 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 learn. Uh, and you'll get a model from that. And that that's what you'll use in your, uh, your software. I'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, so this machine learning, so how does that fit in into the broader AI field? Well, again, although in principle it could be machine learning could span general AI, narrow AI, because the whole field is just narrow AI, machine learning is a subset of that. So what happens? Somebody writes a program which says, I want to solve this problem and you give it a lot of data and you're going to start recognizing patterns in that data and come up with some model so the, the software which you write for training is generally pretty small it's most of the logic no longer comes from your programming but it comes from your data the data is your new program ish if you want to learn something new uh, generally just have to go out and get more data, which represents the new problems that you're facing. This training takes a lot of time. Uh, so it's generally done on GPUs, like big GPU clusters. If you're experimenting yourself, you can get away with a MacBook or something. Uh, training takes like a five minutes and then you can come up to a big data set and all of a sudden it takes hours. So very soon as you're gonna be using GPUs, and that helps a lot. And the result of training on your data is you get a model. 
which can say, like this email that's coming in, I got a model which can classify <coughs> emails. So this email, well, it's not spam, or it is spam. So that's generally machine learning flow. Then this email problem would be a case of supervised learning, where you have um, labels which are data, email is spam or not spam. And then there's another broad set of uh, uh, problems, which would be unsupervised learning. And there's these a bit somewhat smaller problem sets like uh, recommended systems. And maybe you also like this movie, or uh, people who bought this also bought this. Are we learning what you call it like that? You get the gist of it. <coughs> I'll take a look at supervised learning later because that's the, the big one I think we're all interested in. But unsupervised learning uh, should get like a small mention. Say you get a data set from somebody and they're like, well, we know this is stuff is important. We got all this data from all our customers. But what can we learn from it? So you get a data set and maybe you plot it out on a graph. You get something like this. So what, what can you do with it? Generally, all you can really do with it is like find clusters of similar data. So if somebody is in this group, they're probably also similar to this person, or maybe you can find correspondence between this point and that point. It's very limited in scope. Most of us are really interested in supervised learning problems where you want to know the right answer, like this image, is it a cat or a dog? Or this email, is it spam or not spam? Or more involved example, this still frame from a camera image, uh, where are all the cars located? Where are all the pedestrians? So you've got a, a data set, and for every example, you've got a, a right answer. So, supervised learning, uh, I want to dive into like the, the core of what machine learning is. Um, go all the way up to neural networks, which are all the hype right now. And the best place to start is linear regression. You might remember this one from school back in the day. I did, I didn't recall it at the time, but uh, um, it's at the core of neural networks and it's it's a bit mathematical, but uh, pretty easy to get a grasp of what's happening on the loop. So, say again, you have a data set, some structured data, you got something on the X, something on the Y. This example is uh, you've got the living space on the X axis, and then there's the housing price. So, it's just uh, housing prices based on uh, house size. You can plot it out on a graph and then you can ask yourself, well, new house just popped up, it's right over here. What would be a good price for this house using only this data? Well, we as a human might be able to say like, yeah, somewhere around there. But if you want to let a machine do it, you're going to come up with some kind of method for that. So maybe you just start drawing a line through there which is like a good fit for your data. So, you know, if you've got a, an inclination, which would be your parameter A, and some starting height, which would be your parameter B. And the question is then, right, I want to learn the best line, which fits through this data, uh, so that, well, with the best line fits through the data, what should be A and B? That's what your algorithm, uh, that's what the learning step is going to do for you. <clears throat> but what is the best fit for this line? Well, for that, you need a, some sort of cost function. So every learning problem has got a cost function or a utility function, which would be like the opposite of this. Uh, in this case, you've got a cost and you want to minimize that cost. So your line fits the data best. This is a uh, least square and it's used for linear regression. It's a very standard way of doing this. And it's saying basically this, this line you have, for every example, look at how far it is away from that line and take the distance and add it up. And don't just add it up. Points which are further away 
it should maybe have a bit more influence on the, the overall outcome because the point is very far away. Yeah, it's not a really big fit, so we'll put a square in there. So take a minimum of this least of squares. And then you're going to say, right, computer, start learning for me. So what is happening here is you've got a line. And it starts out generally with some random value. In this example, I think they start out with an inclination of zero. And uh, there's no B in this, this scenario, but staying blind. You start out with something, and then you start looking at, well, what is my cost at that point? And it's pretty high. Right? But you can look at, well, maybe if I go this direction, I got a better line. So the next step, it goes up and the cost decreases. And you keep iterating over that, like put the GPU to work, and after a couple of minutes, you get this thing start to stabilize and say, all right, that's enough. I like this, and you've got your line through your data set, and now you can finally answer. At this point, that should be a good price for this house. That's linear regression, and it's very useful if you've got continuous data, but we're generally interested in like classification problems. Like this image, is it a, is it a cute puppy or is it a kitten? And for that, we go into the next problem, um, logistical regression. So say you've got some data about cats and dogs. And let's say we've got structured data something on the x-axis, something on the, the y-axis. I made this data up, so as you can imagine, there's there's something like claw size or hair length, which clearly distinguishes cats and dogs. And if we would have it like this, and you would ask a human, this new point in there, is it a cat or a dog? It would probably say, oh, it looks like this. But, but how do you know that? Well, here you could also fit a line through there, maybe not it like this, rather perpendicular. Say everything on that side of the line is a cat, and on the other side is a dog. And again, we can teach a computer to get to this line by minimizing some cost function. The cost function is going to be a bit more convoluted. You don't have to know it, but uh, it's also made of two parts because now you've got the right answer and the wrong answer. The same principle applies. You just start out with some random value. And over time, the computer learns the best fit for this data. And now again, you can ask at this point, is it a cat or a dog? And it's on this side of the line, so it's probably a dog, right? All of this is machine learning narrow AI. So this would be linear regression, which was the first example. Logistic regression, which was a second example, but they're not really used that often. Logistic regression is, by the way, a very good tool. Uh, try that first if you're dealing with a problem. But neural networks are even cooler. So how does a neural network work? So we can take the same data, the probability of something be a cat or a dog, and some inputs, which we have in the input layer, and then there's a hidden layer. So what does this, this image mean? Well, these are just the inputs. The first layer in neural network is always the input. And these things in between, those are the, the neurons. So what, what is such a neuron? Well, it's actually very similar to the logistic regression we saw before. So uh, let's see, maybe this neuron, it will have as an input claw size, hair length, and eye size. And this neuron, it will have as an input the output of the other neuron, and a couple of more. So there's like some, some hidden state in there, and it learns some uh, hidden features on its own. These lines you see in here, those are actually the connections between the neurons and they represent the weights. So they could be like the, the angles of uh, the weight of every uh, input. 
And you might ask yourself, well, if we got logistic compression, which does the same thing, why would we resort to a neural network? Well, that's because you can get more complex boundaries. Uh, practice examples don't really split down the middle nicely, so you get like mm -hmm. wiggly line and more complex your neural network, the more layers, the higher you make it, the more complex boundaries you can get. So that's where neural networks are good at. And then there's the thing where neural networks are all the rage right now. But why is that? Because these things were invented back in the 1970s, I think, or something. But they've been around a long time. I learned from it at school, but uh, they weren't really used back then. It's just like a theoretical exercise. These things exist, but yeah, they kind of work like brains. We don't do it. Uh, we do now because we have a lot of data. Uh, GPUs are really powerful, very commoditized, and it's easy to put it up in the cloud. And the algorithms have gotten a lot better. And that's especially true if you go back to the image classification problem, cats and dogs, and actually focus on was it a cat or a dog based on the image. You need something more than the neural network we saw before. You need like big neural networks with a lot more going on in there. So this is an example of neural network PGD-16. It's all the way, uh, it's old now, but it still works. And they got some beautiful images. <laughs> so what we see here is a neural network again. And this last part, it's pretty similar to what we saw before. So it's just given what all the calculations which happened before that, you can make some decision value, some complex decision. And then there's, these are layers, neural network layers. And then there's something called a max pooling layer. That's a trick to get very big networks down to medium big. And there's convolutional layers. And those are really at the heart of most uh, image classification systems right now. So I won't dive into too much into it. Maybe if you had convolutions at school, you know what, it, what they do. It's basically the same. They're used for edge detection. So say if this is the input image, we look at a, a layer very close to the input image. What, what does it detect? Well, it's going to detect edges, so like transitions from light to dark, maybe on different, at different angles or color gradients, like very fine features. And then once you go further into this neural network, it's taking all those, those edges, those fine features, and it's grouping them into more uh, more coarser features, such as maybe stripe patterns. We're beginning to see some hair like features here, maybe curves or eyes. And further down the network, it's beginning to resemble what we would recognize. Like, uh, this looks like a tomato or a ladybug, or this definitely detecting wheels, or maybe some nice texture. This could be used for giraffe, giraffe classifying. All the way at the back of the convolutional layers, it's fed into our network, which we could still understand a bit, right? Uh, and that network will learn, like, oh, if I want to recognize a cat, I need this feature, I need that feature, I need that feature. And based on that, it will say, well, this is a cat, and I'm pretty sure about it or maybe not. And the cool thing about it is, is as a developer, <coughs> you just say, this is the layout of my network, or probably just take that network and I'm gonna work with it. And the, the learning process will learn not just which features to recognize, but it will actually learn what features are of interest at all. It will learn like, oh, maybe if I'm detecting cars, I need to detect wheels. That's, that's an important feature. We, haven't, we didn't need to learn of that, we just picked it up itself. So it's really powerful. Um, yeah, so I'm just uh, touching the basics here. 
if you want to dive into this yourself, uh, I suggest you just go to Google Vision. You can feed it like a couple of folders with your categories and some example images, and it will give you a really good classifier to go uh, go and use. Or maybe you want to do some uh, more involved thing. You can try Amazon SageMaker. And if you need a neural network or something of the sort on premise, or maybe a small homegrown solution, you might want to have a look at uh, Keras. It uses TensorFlow and Root. I think TensorFlow, many of you have heard. Uh, but TensorFlow <coughs> itself is pretty difficult to, to get around. And Keras is like a nice syntactical sugar layer on top of it. That helps if you're trying to work with it. And if you really want to dive into it, this uh, suggests the machine learning Coursera course. It's like a 10 week course, but it's absolutely brilliant. Um, I'm working on some, uh, some fun projects besides machine learning. Uh, I've got a blog if you want to check it out. And that was my talk, so uh, if you got any questions, I'm always.